Good evening, everybody. Uh, I don't usually think of myself as a storyteller, but as a historian, but this will be a first for me. Um, I grew up in St. Lawrence County in the northwest corner of DeKalb in a community called Osbourneville, which if you haven't heard of it, it's a little bit north of North Governor. And if you haven't heard of Governor, it's a li even further north of Governor. So anyway, just to put you in, in the neighborhood, and my father's family has been farming in that neighborhood on the banks of Beaver Creek since 1805, so they've been there a little while. I grew up on a family farm with three generations of people, um, from my grandparents all the way down to us, and we always had chores to do. I remember the very first regular chore I had to do was to pay for my lunchbox when I started first grade. My mother brought me a lunchbox just before I started and said, now you have to go get the cows every day when you get off the bus when you come home from school. And that was my first chore I ever had at home. And as I got older, more responsibilities came along with it. Uh, one of the annual responsibilities in the summertime uh, on a small mixed farm, we put our cows out to pasture. They didn't just stay in a feedlot somewhere. And after the hay was cut, the fields regrow with this really lush grass, which we call afterfeed. And so when we got the afterfeed feed in the pasture, then the cows would go in there to eat. Well, this didn't always agree with the cows, and so we, they had very loose stool. And so one of our jobs as kids, ordinarily when the cows were in normal conditions, we'd let them all out when everybody was done milking and drive them out of the barn. But if you remember those old star, stall barns, one of the things farmers were proud of was how white and clean they kept the central floor and kept it lined. Well, if you let cows have diarrhea all over that central floor, it won't be white no matter how much lime you put on. So we were assigned to let out every six cows when they were milked. And so that I was one day I was at the barn and it was my job to have when six cows were done, drive them out of the barn as fast as I could. And if I was really lucky, nothing got on the floor. And now to top this all off, it was August and all the rest of my, my relatives had moved away. And my city cousins always were sent up to spend a week with us in August, and they took turns. So there were always city cousins there to watch. And they were always so impressed because we weren't afraid of these cows or the chickens or the turkeys or whatever. So anyway, I'm there, and I start letting these cows out, and I'm showing my cousins what a good job I can do. And I start running down the aisle after them. Remember, I'm nine years old. I'm this tall. I go running down chasing these cows. And I get right up behind the last one and splat! I'm covered from head to foot in cow manure and I am just totally humiliated. I'm trying to impress my cousin and instead I'm covered with cow manure from head to foot. I start to cry and I run out of the barn and I run to the house. My mother sees me coming and she comes to the door and she locks the screen door and won't let me in the house to add insult to injury. And then she appears from around behind the house with a garden hose and proceeds to hose me down from head to foot. And that has to be one of the most humiliating work incidents of my entire life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for starting us the night off with a lot of laughter. <laughs> um, I want to make a couple more introductions that I forgot the first time. Actually, we have some people from the station tonight, which is very exciting. I want to introduce the rest of the North Country work team that's with us. So right at the back, who's doing our timing tonight and letting our storytellers know when they're getting close, is Claire Mendez, and she is our outreach coordinator. And then over Manning, um, the, doing the videography tonight is Nora Bradford, who's a North Country at Work intern this summer. Um, and then we also have, oh, he's, he's seeing, no, no. John in the back, who's our underwriting director. And, right. And then we've got Dale Hobson uh, over here in the corner, and he is our digital editor. 
So thank you so much for that. Also, right now we have this incredible lineup of six, but we are going to have an open mic portion afterwards. So if you feel so compelled to tell your own work story at the end, you'll have the opportunity. Um, so our second storyteller is actually Michael Welch, and he has been a mailman, or he retired from being a mailman just last year. Um, and I interviewed him last year, and it was one of the most interesting interviews I've done because it turns out I didn't know anything about what a mailman actually does, including how much they walk every day. So if we could give a big round of applause for Michael Welch. Thank you. Yeah, it was fascinating being out on the radio. Uh, I'm a singer by nature, so this is a little bit different for me. I can get up in front of thousands of people and sing all night, but public speaking may, not, may or may not be my forte. Um, <laughs> It's no coincidence, I retired seven months ago today. Uh, seven months ago today was my last day at the post office. Thank you. I walked between 12 and 14 miles a day. My girl, ex-girlfriend bought me a Fitbit, one of those things that you put on the wrist to, to measure the amount of steps you take a day. And uh, She used to call me in the morning and say, I put 9,000 steps on my Fitbit, and it would be 10 o'clock in the morning, and, and I was already past 30,000. I looked at a picture of myself in the, um, from about a month before I retired, and my stomach was flat. <laughs> yeah. So I'm on a new regimen. I, I, I went out last night, and I, I took the car around, and I mapped out about a four-mile walking route that I'm going to start getting back into that regimen because it's easier to put it on than it is to take it off, I found out. <laughs> um, Whatever you hear about a mailman is true. I don't know how much people really hear about mail carriers, but whatever you do hear about them is true. People wouldn't ask me, how do you deal with the cold or the heat or um, how many miles do you walk? They'd always ask me about dogs. That was their primary thing. Have you ever been attacked? Have you ever? And I only had one incident, because dogs know dog lovers. Dogs, dogs sense fear. Dogs sense People that don't like dogs, dogs know. They have a way of knowing. And those are the people that they go after. So in my 31 and a half year span of delivering the mail, I was attacked one time by a Doberman. And it was at a college fraternity in the middle of the wintertime. And I found out that you cannot run up and stand on top of a Volkswagen bug in the middle of the wintertime very easily. They don't have a lot of traction. So I, I stood up there on this balancing act for all about five minutes till one of the fraternity boys came out. And, and uh, the, one thing I, I, the one thing I want to stress is in, in this society today, it's so easy to get rid of information. If you have a phone call that you don't want to, that you don't no longer want to listen to, you just delete it. If you have an email that you don't want to look at anymore, you just hit the delete button, it's gone. Um, the handwritten letter, I still have letters in my drawers from years ago. Um, I mean, letters that my mom wrote me, old love letters from long ago. Um, there's something about it. There's something about the written, that written letter that you can look at that's non-disposable. It's treated with a little bit more sanctity than this day and age where we can just dispose of things. Um, it was, I'm so grateful. This job that I, I did for 31 and a half years probably saved my life because before then I worked in the bar industry and that was not the best scenario to be working in. And uh, I'm filled with nothing but gratitude for, and I found out also what you give, you get back. When I went to retire, every one of my customers came up to me and said, how much they were going to miss seeing me every day. And uh, we're given a big opportunity. There were some people in the village of Potsdam who would actually let me walk into their place every day and put the mail on the counter, put the mail on their kitchen counter. Probably couldn't do that in the city. <laughs> Wouldn't go over real well. But it, it, it was okay, though, in Potsdam because I got to know people in terms of the trust that they trusted me, I trusted them. And the mailman has more responsibility than just delivering the mail every day. People would leave town. I had a, one of my guys I worked with 
went by a place a couple days in a row and noticed that the mail had been piling up inside the mailbox. So he went and he went to, down to the police department and they found out that the woman that was inside of the house had fallen down and could not get up and she laid there for about a day and a half. So believe it or not, he was responsible because he kept an eye out for what was going on. And that's the way I felt about, about each and, and every one of my customers. Um, but I would recommend retirement to anybody. <laughs> I really would. I would strongly recommend it. The, the, the last thing is dreams do come, come t true. Back in 1984, I lived in Clayton, New York with my then fiance. And I was working at a bar, and there was a guy in town who delivered the mail during the day. And at night, he played the bass in a rock and roll band. And I remember vividly turning to her and saying, that's what I want to do. I want to be a mailman by day so I have security and I have a good steady job. Then at night, I want to go out and be able to play music. That all came true. I'm fortunate enough to be in one of the best bands in the North Country. And we played last night up at the Norwood Village Green. And last week, I had four gigs in three days. This weekend, I got three gigs in four days. How that ties into the work at the post office is it ties in, I've got more time to do what I really love to do, and that's to go out and play music and just enjoy life. So thanks for letting me share. Northbound. There you go. Northbound. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Can we get another round of applause for Mike? Thank you. So our third storyteller tonight, her name is Catherine Bennett, but she goes by Cat. Um, and I would say I would say that your work actually takes up most of your life. Um, <laughs> um, so if we could get a big round of applause for Cat, thank you. So Amy said my work takes up most of my life because I'm a farmer. Um, <laughs> so I'm often awake when most people are asleep. Um, I run a small potato business named Milkweed Tussock Tubers, and I do have shirts for sale in the back of my car because that's what I do. It funds the potatoes. <laughs> All right. Um, so my story actually has a title. Uh, I call it Why Regenerative Agriculture is Revolutionary. Okay. The coffee my intern drinks is sold by Smuckers, a corporation so large that it has its claws in multiple companies in countries. When I stare at the black and yellow bag on the table, I'm reminded of other farmers, of women who are forced to fight, flee, or submit based on whether or not the smuckers run bulldozers have obliterated their family farms, turning diversified gardens into sun-bleached plantations of small red berries. That red color I see reflected in my neighbors in the breast of the ruby-throated hummingbird as they flit through our permaculture garden, sipping nectar from comfrey and getting insects for their babies. Those hummingbirds are also threatened by the Smuckers Company because their habitat is bulldozed, the one they live in in the winter. So when they arrive 3,540 miles north from their winter habitat every year, I breathe a sigh of relief because I know that when they're in my garden, they have a few months of safety. My work, my family's work, and my intern's work is all about those moments of interconnectedness, of recognizing that there's really no difference between us, the hummingbirds, the women in the tropical countries. On 112 acres, we strive for regenerative agriculture. We rejuvenate soil, we build hedgerows, we supply my aunt uh, with a lifetime's worth of colored potatoes, and we try to maintain a sense of humor when the stress gets to be too much. For instance, 3 a.m. is a really great time for cows to stand in the middle of the road, <laughs> and for lambs to be born, and for pigs to die. This year, it was the drought that caused the most aggravation, and it found us loading Gatorade bottles and trash cans into my intern's car so that we could drive to the Hubleton Cemetery and get water from the public faucet for our gardens. I never thought I would be doing this. When a friend gave me the name of my future business, I said, well, thank you, but I'm never going to have a farm. <laughs> 
And the list of people who don't think I'm doing this is actually pretty substantial. Usually, when people see my gender and my slight build, they look straight past me when they ask for the boss. So those sorts of things are one of the more subtle aspects of the challenges female farmers face in the world. Down south, it's Conagra and Syngenta and Smuckers saying, you have to sell us our, your land or we're going to kick you off. I face in De Poister, Roundup Ready cornfields three miles down the road, and my neighbor who really wants to bulldoze all of our hedgerows and turn the hundred-year-old oaks into tables. So every day, I question whether or not my time would be better spent raging against the tyranny, dismantling dams and machines and pesticide sprayers. We are the farmers with the most to lose. We are the peasants. Why would I not want to be a part of the battle? But then I remind myself what I do here. I teach in a community where compost is a foreign concept. I gather food scraps and cardboard. I bring uh, trust fund college students into pig pens with birthing sows. I expose my neighbors to the deep bleeding purple of a magic molly potato. I plant nine barks and bladder nuts in an attempt to establish sanctuaries for endangered pollinators. And that's why regenerative agriculture is revolutionary. Because in a time when the economic and political systems are designed to tear us apart, it actually pulls us together. It does the exact opposite. My work is a small part of a web of people and places that bring us back to our center, our communities, and make us whole. Every small farm that stands today is a light to be seen by. So I hope you remember the coffee, the hummingbirds, the women who feed the majority of the world. I hope you question your decisions every day and then turn around and plant native lobelias because this winter, 3,540 miles from here, a tiny, brilliant hummingbird will be sipping nectar from a tropical hibiscus. And that hibiscus will grow on a small holdout of peasant farms where the strength of the women keep them together in the face of danger. The rapid bird's heart will beat and the nutrients from the tropical hibiscus will combine with the nutrients from the North Country lobelia and be pushed into the bloodstream of a tiny body that connects our two lands. That was really beautiful, Kat. I could really see a lot of the things you were talking about. So that was our first three storytellers. We have three more to go. And Ellen Rocco is actually going to tell us a short little story right now. So I feel so connected to the story that Kat just told and to Brian's story because um, my very first job in the North Country, when I moved here as the, um, the uh, antiquated version of back to the land and farming, Cat represents the new generation of, of people trying to make it on small farms. I bought my farm in 1970, moved here in 1971. My property abuts Brian's current um, farm. We are, we're land-bound neighbors. But my first job in the North Country was as a substitute teacher. I, we were struggling to get a little homestead going and we needed money because as any homestead will tell you, money is the rarest commodity. So um, uh, the two schools that I substitute taught in were Governor and Herman DeKalb. And I was desperate for money so I said yes to any, any substitute teaching job even though most of the regular substitute teaching crowd said no to most of them. They had like, I'll teach 10th um, grade English, I'll teach the good third grade class, I'll, you know, they had like, they'd call me and say, 
would you come in and teach, and I kid you not, what was called at that time the DISTARD class, which was Disabled Retarded, that was what it was short for, that is what it was called, and it was grades basically one through six, all lumped together in a room. I'd say, yep. I'm in for it. They'd say, would you teach the problem kids in 10th grade the, the, or the not good class? Yep, I'm in. And once in a while, I'd get the honors, 12th grade honors English class. And guess who was in that class? Brian Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> And here's the reason, aside from money, that teaching as my first gig in the North Country was perfectly fine. Because at the time, I had even more of a New York City ac accent. I had moved directly from Manhattan to the Maple Ridge Road in the February of 1971. That's another story. But um, my hair was out to here. You know, I, I was like a wild woman. And I showed up in the, in the classrooms of Governor or Herman DeKalb, and literally, you know, people would say, oh, that class is going to, they're going to be running all over the room, they're going to be out in the halls, you're never going to have any control over them. And I'd walk in, and all the mouths would drop open, and they were putty in my hand. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to connect to that and to connect with, with Kat's eloquent um, story about being a small farmer, being a farmer who holds out for the dirt, for the, for the birds, for the plants that are as a great hero of mine, um, uh, Robin Gail Kimmerer puts it, the more than human species around us. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for coming. So our next storyteller is named Bill Hull, and he's shared a lot of stories actually with the project because it feels like he's lived multiple lifetimes. He's, he's done so many different things. And actually, what I've talked to him more on the radio about is milk truck driving. Um, but tonight, it's actually about a different kind of driving. So please welcome Bill Hull. Can you hear me all right if I don't put this mic up? Hello? Okay. Is it okay for you, Nora, your corner? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to pass out some photos. These aren't the best photos, but they'll at least do. So I'm going to hand them around. You can pass, pass them around. So tonight I'm going to talk about driving charter buses. So, I, and I'm sorry, I'm going to read some of this because it's just too much for me to try to do me from memory. So back in January of 1982, a company called Flack Tours in Lisbon hired me to drive school buses, also to do grease jobs, oil changes, and some light mechanical work. And, but they also had big plans for me. At that time, they had one motor coach and one driver, and pretty soon they were going to have a second motor coach, and they were grooming me to drive it. So sometime in February or March, they sent me as a passenger on a ski trip up to Tupper Lake. And the driver that they had drove the trip, and he and I talked about what the bus was like and what the work was like on the way up. And after the passengers got off, he let me get behind the driver's, get in the driver's seat and take the bus for a spin. So this bus was a 1966 GM coach, model PD4107, which is in the photos you're going to see. And it formerly served the Voyager lines in Canada. It had seats for 41 passengers and a bathroom on its 35-foot frame. Powered by an 8V71 Detroit diesel, it had an unsynchronized four-speed transmission with solenoid reverse. Although I had experience with all sorts of multi-speed truck transmissions, this simple four-speed proved the most difficult thing to shift I had ever encountered. Every double-clutched upshift or downshift required absolute perfection or your passengers in the back of the bus would hear horrible grinding of gears. My initial test drive around Tupper Lake proved successful, and soon I had my first charter, a fraternity from Potsdam going to visit their frat brothers in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I pulled up in front of the bulbous... I don't envy you. <laughs> you haven't heard the story yet. 
So I pulled up in front of the bulbous Queen Anne style house on Elm Street and the fraternity members loaded two kegs of beer before settling in their seats. In my training, I was instructed to look straight ahead and drive straight ahead and ignore passengers drinking or doing drugs. They had paid for the trip and that entitled them to do what they wished. So it worked fine all the way to Worcester. The return trip was another story. On the way back, people began throwing up. Two drunken students climbed up into the overhead luggage racks to sleep it off. And by the time we got back to Potsdam, several seats and a couple windows had been broken. The bus went back to the shop for cleaning and repair and then was ready to make another trip. So during my first year, I took a lot of college students on charters and often had similar damage to the coach until the company decided to amend its policy. Uh, some years later, this came to a head when the United States Customs Service declared a zero tolerance policy for drugs at the border. If a passenger on the coach was found in possession of drugs, the coach itself could be confiscated. Now we were instructed to make sure none of our passengers had drugs on them, as if we could screen people with our x-ray vision. <laughs> so about half of our trips had destinations in Canada, mostly Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. We took high school students on senior trips, senior citizen groups to various venues, and made trips to baseball games and botanical gardens. Returning from a Montreal Expos game one Sunday afternoon, the air conditioning belts came off the pulleys on the newer MC8 coach that I was driving and clipped the hose clamps for the radiator. We lost coolant and we had to get off the road, fortunately just before the highway turned into a limited access freeway. The service station where we stopped had new hose clamps, thank goodness but could not legally sell them to us due to the Sunday blue laws in Quebec. We can't sell you these, it's Sunday. <laughs> well, after seeing 47 passengers milling around their station for a while, they found a way to provide the clamps. And I, dressed in a suit, climbed up on upside down trash cans to install them and put antifreeze and water up in this seven foot high radiator tube that was seven foot off the ground. And we got back on the road and came home. So not only you know, did I drive the bus, I also had to fix it quite a, quite a few times. Flag Tours also did quite a bit of business with three-day charters to Atlantic City. We would make the trip there in perhaps eight hours, and the passengers could get some action on the slot machines before the day's end. At that time, Atlantic City had some 1,000 buses arriving every day and had very strict rules regarding loading and unloading. We generally, had two, we generally had 10 minutes to do each and had to leave under threat of a heavy fine if passengers were miss, even if passengers were missing. One time, a passenger did not get to the gate as time was running out, and I sent another to look for her. It turned out that she had just won about $2,000 and was cashing out. When the two ladies got on the bus at the very last minute, the first one thanked me for waiting and explained that had it not been for the immediacy of leaving, she certainly would have put all $2,000 back in the machines hoping for a bigger payout. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of senior citizens trips, and these often went to fascinating places. I used to tell people that my job entailed going on other people's vacations with them. One time while driving such a group, some, some older ladies in the front of the bus started talking about hot flashes. Overhearing their conversation, I learned a few things, <laughs> and I found it somewhat interesting. Finally, one of the women stated very matter-of-factly, and you know, some people never get them. Immediately, I piped up, I've never had one. <laughs> <laughs> to which a woman replied, you, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Another memorable trip transported a bachelor's party from Alex Bay to the Manitana Hotel in Brockville. All went well on the way. We crossed the Thousand Island Bridge and dro drove down the Canadian side of the St. Lawrence, arriving in good time. The men came to see female strippers at the historic hotel, and I went in to see the show for a little while too. <laughs> After a while, I came back out to the bus and found several people in the back smoking marijuana. I explained to them as politely as I could that they had to get rid of the drugs and air out the bus before we could go back across the bridge. 
one of the guys admonished me to relax. And I retorted that they needed to take this seriously as we could lose the bus if drugs were found at the border. Again, I was told to relax. And I was informed that one of the passengers on the trip was an off-duty state trooper and that he would get us through. <laughs> well, a couple hours later, we returned to the United States and with some trepidation, I pulled up to customs. An agent got on the bus and asked me where we were coming from. As he turned to walk through the bus, a passenger arose from the back and came forward, startling the customs agent. Ooh. But then a recognition set in. Oh, how are you? The off-duty trooper said fine and gave a brief description of the trip. The customs agent disembarked without ever talking to the other passengers. <laughs> and we went on our way. I guess it pays to know the right people. <laughs> in closing, on one college trip in the 1980s, I took a rugby team to Albany. After the game, the passengers went to a party and I went to a Chinese restaurant, something not available in St. Lawrence County at the time. After eating a delicious meal, I opened my fortune cookie to read, your place in the path of life is in the driver's seat. <laughs> Give it up for Bill Hall. Thank you. So the great thing about work stories is really, you realize that we don't talk about it that much, but this is what you do for like nine hours of the day, every day. 14 or, or 14 or 16 hours every day. <laughs> and when you start sort of opening that door, you know, people have so much to say and you really get a glimpse into what like all the people around you are doing. And I would say that most lines of work are pretty unique and different. But our next storyteller, Regina, hers is, hers is pretty unique, I would say. She's a midwife. Uh, so let's give a big round of applause for Regina Willett. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I am a midwife. And I'm a modern midwife. I'm fully licensed by New York State to practice in home, hospital, or birth center. But my true love and commitment is for home birth, and that's where I've practiced. And birth is not like you see in the movies and in TV, all this uh, terrific drama, over-dramatization, and people running around and save my baby, emergency, emergency. It's usually very calm and very peaceful. And I'm gonna talk about a little uh, bit of uh, the birth scene that you usually uh, don't get a chance to see, and that's humor in birth. And as an example, um, I had a, a client uh, several years ago, and uh, she was having her fourth baby, and this was her first home birth. And at prenatal checkups, she would say to me every time, I scream in labor. That's just how I do it. Don't worry about me. I'm not panicking. I'm not dying. I just scream in labor. And I said, well, you know, you're going to be in your home. People surrounding you who love you, you know them. You're in your own comfortable space. And I will be very surprised if you scream. And she said, well, I just wanted to let you know that's going to happen, and so don't get disrupted by it. And I said, okay, we'll see what happens. So she goes into labor, and uh, her two uh, oldest children were there, and she wanted them to be at the birth. And so they were still kids. They weren't old. And so she's barreling along in labor, and the kids are getting bored, like kids do in labor. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty boring until the baby comes out. And uh, so the kids are at that age where they're talking about, uh, learning about humor and uh, telling jokes and riddles. And so out of boredom, the kids started telling jokes. And these kids were comedians. I mean, they were really funny. And we were just laughing and laughing, and then all the adults in the room start telling jokes. And we're having this big old joke party, and we're just about rolling around on the floor. We're laughing so hard. And finally, the woman in labor says, stop. Stop telling jokes. I'm laughing so hard, I can't have the baby. <laughs> so we stopped laughing. 
very soon after that, she went on to have a, a beautiful bouncing baby boy, and everything was fine. And later, I said to her, I thought you said you were <laughs> and she actually went on to have four more children uh, at home, and I don't think she's going to bring with them either. Uh, and uh, another example of humor in labor is uh, the first baby that I ever caught. Uh, she was uh, someone I had, it was her second baby, and I had been there as a friend at her first birth, and by now I was an apprentice, and my preceptor was gonna be there, so she said, okay, here's your first catch. And uh, so this woman goes into labor, and they lived in this big old rambling farmhouse at the end of a dirt road, off in the hinterlands of Franklin County, and uh, there were two couples that shared this big old farmhouse and they each had a daughter, two, three years old. And they wanted the kids to be at the birth. So, okay, so we prepared the kids and, uh, you know, there was no YouTube or videos for the kids at that point. So uh, we, we did a lot of talking with the kids and got them all ready because they're pretty tiny and we got a, an adult to, be their caretaker, and if things got a little hairy for the kids, that uh, they would see to their needs. So this woman is laboring away, I mean, really strongly laboring, and she is just a woman in her power in labor, and she's just gathering all this energy and just working, working, working really hard. They don't call it labor for nothing. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so she is incredible, a birthing goddess. And then she says, time, time to push, I've got to push. So, okay, we're gonna have a baby. So she gets there, she starts pushing, and she's pushing, and she's pushing, you see a little bit of the baby's head. And then she pushes, and a little bit more of the baby's head, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and finally, here comes the baby's head. It's coming out, and the baby's head is out, and the contraction is over, and she takes some deep breaths to oxygenate her baby, and then this amazing thing that happens in most births happened, and the baby, when it comes out, comes through the, uh, it, it's facing the woman's back when the baby comes out because that's the position where the biggest part of the baby's head can fit through the widest part of the narrow pelvic bones. And after the head is out, the woman gets a little break and this amazing thing happens where the baby turns a half arc, a quarter circle, so the shoulders are now, the wide shoulders are in position to come through the widest part of the narrowest part of the birth canal. And baby does this entirely on its own. It's really cool to watch. And so baby turns and she says, here comes another contraction. And so she gives a nice push and out comes the baby, beautiful pink, blonde baby boy over nine pounds. The baby comes out and it's breathing. It doesn't even cry. It's breathing. And we're just in awe. I mean, this is incredible. We're all just speechless. And there's this big silence in the room because nobody can even say anything. And so this silence goes on and then all of a sudden this little voice pipes up and says, it's got a string on it. <laughs> and we had tried to prepare really well, but somehow umbilical cord didn't quite enter into their brain. And, uh, but a string on the baby uh, entered. That, that made sense to them. Uh, and it was very cute. And the, the moral of the tale is that uh, 
we all come into this world with strings attached. <laughs> So we actually got to hear that story a little earlier, and Ellen said after, she said, you know, it's really wonderful when in a story you learn something that you didn't know. And the thing that I didn't know, that she didn't know, is the turning thing, that babies do that just on their own. It's so cool. Um, it's just amazing. Um, so our last storyteller is coming up, um, and we didn't have anyone sign up on the way in, but is there anyone interested in telling a story afterwards? We do, we have a taker, great, fabulous. <laughs> Huh? Okay. Uh, so our last storyteller is is um, Wayne Lincoln, and he's actually contributed a couple of stories to the North Country at Work project. Um, but he's talking about a really cool. Often we have many different kinds of work in our life, and I would say that this one is one that uh, he's been nurturing for a very long time. Was a bit of a surprise, but has turned into such a passion. So a really big round of applause for Wayne. I repair and rebuild player pianos and Nickelodeons and pump organs and barrel organs and other things that go bump in the night. Um, let's back up. In the 70s, mid-70s, I'm going to southern Maine to visit some friends, then to Corning to visit some other friends. I'm talking to my grandfather, and he said, wow, you need to stop at the Deansboro Music Museum. Well, I'm into hang gliding and scuba diving, and, you know, this doesn't sound terribly exciting. But I'm driving down Route 90 and heading toward Corning, and sign pops up. Deansboro, nine miles. Ah, uh, what am I going to say? You know, I'm too big a hurry to drink beer and swim with my friends. So I pulled in, went to Deansboro, went into the building, and there's this like soda fountain counter with some stools in front of it. And this lady of automated musical museum or music instruments. And she says, there's a lot of them in here. You're free to go in and, and play them. Buy a roll of nickels and help yourself. So I go in. There's the first thing is this concert grand piano. And it's playing on the tape. playing a banjo, another one with violins in it, and you drop your nickel in it and they play songs. Well, we went through 13 rooms of this stuff. It's just amazing. And the last room is a quite a large room, and it looks like an ice cream parlor. It's got wrought iron chairs and tables, and it's kind of pink and blue, and one side of the, that room, the, almost the whole side, was this band orchestration. It's just mesmerizing. It's playing every instrument you can imagine and very loud. <laughs> and down at the end, I spot this half round, half circle of stained glass with an eagle in it in an oak cabinet. I thought, wow, that's really nice. So I went down and I put the nickel in. Probably I'm about my third roll by now. And I played it, and I played it, and I played it. And I said, if this guy would take $1,000 for that machine, I'd buy it right now. I mean, it was the 70s. <laughs> Little did I know. Go a couple years, and I'm working in a store here in Canton, and I had an antique camera display. And this guy comes in, and he says, I got a camera you'd be interested in. So after work, I make my way up to DeGrasse, and I meet with Jack Thomas. And this guy is a genius. But he shows me the camera. And he says, I got some other stuff you'd be interested in. So we go into his garage, which has long since been a garage. And he's got a grand piano playing. And these aren't just regular player pianos. These things reproduce the touch of the original artist. It's a nice machine. And we're talking about it and looking at it. And I look over in the corner, and behind a bunch of boxes and stuff piled up, I was like, 
I'm sure I heard the angels singing. I saw a half round stained glass with an eagle in it. I said, Jack, what is that? He says, that's a KT Seberg Nickelodeon. I've had it for years. I've been going to try to get it working, but I just haven't got to it. I said, I got to have it. And he said, well, it's kind of a lot of money. I said, I got to have it. Well, okay. Well, about a day later, maybe a week later, he comes into the store and he said, I just got a check from Art Sanders. He sold it. I get emotional about this. I went home and got sick. I was physically sick during the night. And I, long story short, I made a deal with Art Sanders. <laughs> and I bought that Nickelodeon. I spent two years sitting in my living room floor staring at parts. Because they all, it, the whole thing had all the parts in the boxes in the bottom of it. For two years. And I'd come across something, I'd go, ah. Oh. i call Art Sanders. I'd say, what the heck? And he'd go, oh, that's a rewind block. You gotta do this and this, and there's little bellows and valves and blah, blah. And people don't understand what's inside these things. It's all air operated, pneumatics, valves, leather. Well, I got it going, it's great. I had people watch, looking at it and playing it all the time. I changed it to a quarter, but. Um, <laughs> by the way, um, it did cost a lot of money. <laughs> so they say, this lady said, can you fix player pianos? I said, well, I don't know. I'll look at it. Well, it was basic compared to this Nickelodeon. <laughs> so I fixed her player piano, and then she talked to somebody else, and then somebody else, and then somebody has a pump organ. Can you do pump organs? I said, probably. <laughs> so I rebuilt a couple pump organs, and it really turned into quite a hobby. And it kind of dwindled off a little bit. Recently, thank you, Amy, I have retired and it's become almost a full-time job. <laughs> um, I'm doing quite a bit of stuff now. I'm thinking, what would my grandfather think? <laughs> the difference that he made in my life. Thank you. <laughs>